Amen. Well, it was good to see everyone out again tonight. You know, we're going to continue with our lesson from last Wednesday. One of the things we had talked about, we put a simple question forth, and I know a lot of, um, I know that uh, last Wednesday, we didn't have that many people here last Wednesday, did we? <laughs> no. no. Okay, but, but here's the thing. The question was, you know, as you're looking for a church, as you're looking for a church, one of the questions we put forth was, what makes a strong church? And I know a lot of times we, we use a different examples of what makes a strong church. A lot of times people think a strong church is a church that just has a whole bunch of members and has a big lot of money coming in and has a nice show that it puts on a very big building with all kind of activity and a recreation center. You know, many people believe that that's what, it, what a, a great church is made by, the number of programs that you have and how smoothly it organizes and how it runs. But what the things, what we covered this past week, uh, last week, you know, that there's a better measure, way to measure whether a church is a strong church or not in the terms that the Bible uses, as the Bible describes a church as a body or as a family or as the temple or as the kingdom and as a bride. And so what we, what we covered last week that the church functions like a body. We used as, as an example that the church is the body of Christ. When you understand that the church is the body of Christ, he uses that as an example as Christ being the head and, 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 the, and the church being the body. Now, I know a lot of times people try to tell you things, but there's something that's, that's something that we know very, very simple about the body. And if you understand things about the body, you'll understand why some of the things that get said in, in Christendom don't make any sense at all. You know, for example, that they want to say that, you know, that like when the, when the, in Ephesians chapter four, when it actually says that there is one body, right? Right? But, and he defines what he means because in the Ephesians chapter one, he said the body is the church. So if there's only one body, how many churches is it? One. See, it makes sense. Because if somebody says that there's a whole bunch of acceptable churches and Christ is the head. Let me show you how silly this is, okay? Let's just, let's just do it the opposite way. What if there's one body? What if, what if there's one body and that body has three different heads? Would that body even know how to function right? Too many, you know, you, it wouldn't be able to work together, right? Let's just look at the opposite direction. What if it's one head, but a whole bunch of bodies? What kind of sense does that make? Hmm. You see, when he's talking about the church being the body, you know, I know, and I don't want us to all see this, just so we actually get this, okay? Just so we get it. Because I know I'm saying a lot of things that many people don't catch. And I don't want to say anything that I can't back up. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. This ain't even my lesson, but we're going to get this for free. Just so we understand, when somebody tries to, try to take something that does not make any sense, and try to justify it. Will somebody be willing to help over here? Help over here to get, to get there quickly so we can move. Just kind of sit over there to kind of get everybody where they need to be at. So in Ephesians chapter 4, let me just show you how simple this is. When we're talking about the body, and this, like I said, we were, I already covered this last week, but I just want to actually use a very simple analogy here, just so we get this. So, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is talking to the church at Ephesus, okay? And he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He said vocation. Now, here's the difference. Here's the question. What is a vocation? You see, see think about that. For example, a lot of times if I said, like, Sarah, what is your vocation? Now, if Sarah was not a member of the church, she'd probably say, I'm a hairdresser. That's her vocation. That's what she does, right? Now, many people think that our vo your vocation, like, for example, is, uh, for example, like, my vocation is a preacher. But that's really not the vocation he's talking about here. He's not talking about being a hairdresser. He's not talking about working for the gas company. He's not talking about being an auto parts counter worker. He's not talking about a, a concrete worker or any of those things. A vocation is what you are called here to do. You see, what you do to make your money, as children of God, what you do to make your money, that's your avocation. That's how you eat and that's how you live indoors. But your vocation is, as a children of God, as a family of God, we're about the Lord's business. That's our vocation. That's our reason for being here. Okay? So he says, I beseech you that you walk worthy of your calling. Okay? 
And he says, that you, I beseech that you are worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and with meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Okay? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He said, endeavoring. I mean, it's going to be, take work to keep the unity. Now, well, what is the root word of the word unity? Unit. Unit. You and I. What does that mean? One, One right? Endeavoring to keep unity. Okay? Now, keep in mind, he said that we're the body, right? And if a body is not working, to get, if a body is not working, if all the parts of the body are not working together, you have to understand you have a handicapped body. Yeah. It doesn't mean that, that a body, that a, person is actually, that a person is actually missing a hand cannot live a meaningful life. But it, or a person that does not have arms cannot live a meaningful life. But you have to understand, you know, when you think about it, normally when a person is born, how many arms do they have? Now, would it be easier to live the life that we live, to use the vehicles that we use, to use the pots and pans and the doors and all the stuff that we use, would it be easier with arms or without arms? So my point I'm trying to make is that it doesn't mean you, a body cannot function without arms, but a body functions better with arms. Because if you don't have arms, what ends up happening, there's this young lady on YouTube we used to watch called, uh, her name was uh, uh, Tisha Unarmed. You ever watch Tisha Unarmed? Man, that girl did some amazing stuff. But here's the thing, she, she had no arms, but she showed you how she'd go through the day and she'd pump gas and everything, and, she was, and she's, a graphic, she's a graphic designer. She can write with her feet and draw with her feet better than I can write, okay? But my point I'm trying to make is, see, usually when you actually eat something, you actually use your hands to eat something. If you're gonna use chopsticks, you use your fingers to hold the chopsticks just right. This lady eats with chopsticks with her feet. But here's the thing, the same, the same uh, 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 digits and the same appendages that she walks in the restaurant on, on are the same ones she has to eat with. It makes things a little tougher. So what you have to understand, it doesn't mean that your body can't function, have a good life, or it can't function, but it functions better when all the parts are there and all the parts are doing their part. You follow me? And so when he describes the church as the body, then you understand the church can only be as strong, the church is only strong when all the members of the body are working together. Because if one member of the body is not doing their job, that means some other member has to do their job, and, it all, and, and if that other member has to do the job of that one member that's not doing their job, then the member, another member does their job and has to do the job that they're supposed to do also. And it hinders. So a body, a, a body or a church that is not functioning as a body, if all the members are not working, the church is handicapped. We all have responsibilities. We all have abilities. Let me say it this way. We all have abilities. Now, I know a lot of times people, and I'm talking to one sister, she said, I just don't know what gifts that God gave me, right? Uh, you know? Now, my point is, is that you may not, but we all have abilities. And if we have abilities, then we have responsibility. Because somebody's taking care of things. You know, I use a very simple example. When the church was a lot smaller, and when we didn't have as many brothers and many sisters showing up, and, and, people taking, and people taking responsibility. You know, when the church got clean, Brother Howe cleaned it. When the Lord's Supper got made, Brother Howe did the Lord's Supper. If nobody showed up to lead singing that day, I led singing and I preached. I did that for a long time. The work still got to get done. But see, when people start stepping up and doing those things, it freed me to do what I do. It freed me to be able to talk to people. See, I'm good at talking. <laughs> I'm not even gonna. I'm gonna <laughs> so when you think about it, look at what he says here, just so we get this, because I know we got some people that are new among us that don't quite catch this sometimes. You see, what you have to understand, the body, Bible like says again in verse number, uh, verse number four, it says, there, there is one body. Matter of fact, let's just do it this way, just so y'all say I'm not saying this, okay? We're going to put Lila on the spot. Lila, would you read that? Verse number four and verse number five. So you saw that, right? 
Now, we're going to be covering on this Sunday the, the one baptism, even though the Bible in the New Testament speaks about five baptisms or as many as seven baptisms. There's only one baptism. You saw that, right? So, he says, there is one body. Now, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, said there is one body and one spirit. Is that a capital S? Yes. That means there's one Holy Spirit, okay? Even as you're called unto one hope of your calling, there is one Lord, right? One faith and one baptism. Did you get that? And then it says, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So here's the question. If a person makes this statement, there's more than one acceptable faith, just as long as you're sincere. Is that a true statement? He said, there's one faith. Did you see that? But you know, people say, it really doesn't make sense what your faith is. It's all the same God. But the Bible said there's one faith. You know, see, here's the thing, Brother Henry. Do you know that if you try to say that there's more than one acceptable faith, you have to say that there's more than one acceptable God then? Because they used the same number, didn't he? One. There's one faith. There's one God. You see, what faith is, it's a body of, uh, it's, it's a body of, of, of understanding. It's a, it's a body of, of, of writings. It's a body of, of, uh, of, of, of faith. It's, it's, it's a body of writings wherewith we build our faith upon. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So our faith comes by hearing what God has said, right? The only way there can be another faith, there has to be another faith, there has to be another God then that said it. Did you catch it? And since there's only one God, there's only one faith. There's only one Lord. There's only one hope. There's only one thing that anybody can look forward to and be guaranteed, and that's based on what Jesus said. There's one hope. There is no other hope without that, without Jesus, okay? But he also said there's one body. Now, if you understand that that's one body, what you can do is you can back up one page in your Bible and go to Ephesians chapter 1. And in verse number 20, Ephesians chapter 1, notice what he says here. He says, in verse number 20, he says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and sat him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above principality, all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And that put all things under his feet. How many things are under his feet? all things under his feet. Now watch this. And gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. <clears throat> Did you see that? He said, so he defined the church as his body. We're members of the body of Christ. Who's the head though? Christ. Not me, not the preacher. He's the head. Christ is the head, right? And we're members of the body. And see, we have to function as a body. And the way your body, your, your, the way your body functions is your head, your head tells your body what to do. Your head, your, all of your, the nerves in your brains and, and your, and your neuro, neuron paths and everything tell your body what to do. Here's the point I'm trying to make here. You see what you have to understand, your hand does not do anything unless your brain sends the message to do it. Has anybody ever had your hand just haul off and slap somebody like, well, I, don't, I don't even know what to tell you. That hand, I, I didn't tell that hand to do that. I'm so sorry. You see my point? What you need to understand is that we're supposed to function as the body of Christ, meaning Christ being the head. If Christ is the head, who does the thinking? You see the point? And we function that way. And for us, a strong church functions like a body with, head, with the Christ being the head telling us everything. He's the head over all things to the church. Not some things. You saw that he said that he made him be the head over all things to the church. Now, if he's the head over all things to the church, I don't decide anything. So here's the thing. If he's head over all things to the church, who decides the name? He does. Who decides how you get into the church? He does. He does. Who decides what name he puts on his people? He does. Who decides how you worship in the church? Who decides how you stay in the church? Who decides if you're out? We do. No. If we out. No. No. No, think about this for a second. Who does he, what you have to understand, there's a lot of people doing stuff that they, they, they that will show up every single Sunday 
but still are not living that way. Who decides if you're out? He does. He does. You see my point? And what we need to understand is, is that many times, many people think that we actually have some say-so in this. The only say-so you have is who you're going to submit to. But you don't get to decide what's right and what's wrong and how the church functions or the body functions. You see, what you have to understand, there's certain things that should happen automatically. You understand, I made a very simple analogy, that we all have to work together. And a lot of times people think that because they're not leading singing that day, or because they're not preaching that day, that they're not needed that day. That's not true. You need to understand that even though you see me standing here, what the, what the Bible would call me is one of the comely parts, one of the pretty parts. Now, nah, y'all don't, y'all take that up with the Lord. I'm just letting y'all know that. I mean, that's just, I'm just, I do want to, I have a, I have a job in the church that is seen a lot. Like Brother Shemaine, he leads singing. He preaches also. We're seen a lot. But you have to understand, that that does not mean that I'm more important to the body than you are. I just have a job. My job is I'm an evangelist, right? Shemaine's job, he's an evangelist. He's a, he's a song leader also. I'm a song leader also. And what you need to understand is that we have a job, but you have a, when we're gathering ourselves together to sing, okay, and he's leading the singing, you need to understand that you're a singer also. And you're not the audience. God's the audience. Yeah. And you need to, so you need to understand that whenever everybody's doing their job in the body, singing, singing with, with the, the first fruits of their, of their singing, praying, believing along with the brothers that God not only hears us, but it will move on our behalf, right? Also, looking out for each other, calling each other by name, preferring one another. You have to understand, that's something that we all have the responsibility to do. But many times we think that we don't have a, a use in the body. In other words, sometimes they think that, well, because like, like, like we read last week, just because I'm not an eye, you know, if, 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 the eye, if the hand said, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, that's not true. Mm-hmm. Hands and eyes need to work together. I'm going to get to you, Pam. Hands and eyes need to work together. You say, well, you know, your hands, your, your eyes need your hands sometimes to see. Like, how can that be? You know, you're on a sunny day in Arizona. You need to have some help sometimes. Yeah. It doesn't mean your eyes can't see without your hand, but your hands can help. Right? And all of these things work together. Y'all know anytime you hurt yourself, if you, if for example, if for example, you're in the kitchen cutting and, you, and, you, and you're chopping something up and you cut your finger, right? Mm-hmm. You know, your eyes don't go like, Man, that looked like that might have hurt, right? And, and, and the toe's like, man, I sure am glad that ain't me because I can't stand on when I got cut, you know? You know? What happens as soon as you cut your hand? Your eyes open up like this, right? Oh, my goodness, you see the blood coming out. The thumb comes up to pinch, right? And if that don't stop it, all of a sudden, the mouse goes, oh, 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 oh. The feet go into that dance mode because it hurts, right? Ah, ah, ah. Right? And if it hurts really bad, that finger, that hand helps that finger into the mouth. You know why? Because that body works, that body works together. Just to make anything going on with any part of the body that's not working right, the whole body functions and goes into motion to make sure that that, 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 that particular member of the body can be comforted and taken care of to be strengthened again to do their part. Y'all know it. Y'all know, y'all, y'all know you've, been, you've been walking through the dark sometime and hit that pinky toe on your bed or something like that and bent that little toenail backwards. And then, man, <laughs> eyes tear up and everything. <laughs> you, <laughs> mouth goes into to motion singing. You're trying, to, you're trying to blow on it like this. <laughs> like that. <laughs> so we have to understand we're, we're one body. And see, since we have that one body, we need to function like one body. I'm trying to help us understand this because most of us understand that there is one body, one church, but some people don't really catch this. When you understand that the Bible actually teaches that there's one church, I don't want you to ever say anything different than what the Lord ever says. If the Lord said there's only one church, I'm not talking about location. We're talking about church. We're talking about body of faith. Okay? There's only one. And I tell people very, very plainly, here's how you know you're in the right place. If there's only one faith, that one faith should be revealed in God's word, right? In other words, if, 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 if an act of faith that you're doing cannot be found inside the Bible, inside God's word, then you know it's not a faith then. That means a man made it up. Right? If it's not in the Bible, somebody made it up. 
Jesus said, in vain do they worship me. They worship me for nothing. They're worshiping me, but they're doing it for nothing. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. So you understand that if it's not found in the Bible, then it's not of faith, okay? Also, if it's not found in the Bible, if you cannot find the name you're calling yourself in the Bible, that can't be the church. If it's not in the Bible, he said he's the head over all things to the church. Everything, right? If you can't find the name that you're calling yourself in the Bible, then it's not the name you should be calling yourself. You see, here's the thing, you know. What I know is, is that people want to call themselves all kind of different names, but Christ is the one who died for his church. It's his church. He's the head of all things to the church, right? And what you have to understand, let's say, for example, you know, see, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a married man, right? And see, I got my little ego here, so, but so I'm going to use another married man to actually get this, right? Just so you understand. So, so it's your man, right? You're married, right? Been married for quite some time. But let's say today you got married, you know, Shemaine's a good guy. Linnell's a wonderful woman, right? And they're going to get married. Now, just so you understand, traditionally speaking, and I'm not talking about this newfangled stuff that people come out with. Traditionally speaking, when Linnell marries Shemaine, whose name does she take? His. Okay? Now, did y'all know that's biblical? Now, no many people don't know that that's biblical, but that actually is biblical. And I'll show you in a minute, just so you get this, just so you understand this, okay? So, the, the point is, is that, so let's say, for example, uh, uh, Shemaine asks Linnell to marry him. She says, yes. And when they're going to get married and everything, uh, after they get married and everything, and it's time to actually put the names and stuff on the marriage certificate and stuff like that. And Linnell looks at Shemaine and says, you know, Shemaine, I love you with all my heart. You're one of the most wonderful man in the whole world. But you know, I like LeBron James, and so I'm gonna put LeBron James as my last, as, James is my last name, because I like LeBron James. I'm married to you, but I wanna have LeBron James' last name because I really love LeBron James, basketball player. He's just a wonderful guy and everything. How do you think Shermaine's gonna feel about that? Some kind of way. <laughs> no. No, no, you're about to, you're, no, you're signing, you, you, you just got married. You just signed in the certificate to send it off now to get your name and everything. And Shermaine's like, nah. Can, uh, can we get a do-over, Brother Hal? My point is, you ain't going to feel good about that. Why not? He's, Shermaine's a nice guy. Names aren't important, right? You see, we're going to talk in a second. See, when, when Christ acts as the head over all things to the church, we're going to see also that the church is called the bride of Christ. Isn't it interesting that people will say that they're the church, which is the bride of Christ, but they want to call themselves by somebody else's name? I would have an issue with that. But for some reason, we always think that the names are not important. No, there's one church. And if there's one church and he's the head over it, whose name should be on it? Christ's name should be on it, right? That's why, you know, we call, when people say, well, what kind of Christian are you? Like, is there any other kind? <laughs> What's the point I'm trying to make here? There's no such thing as, I'm going to go all the way down the line. There's no such thing as a Catholic Christian, a Methodist Christian, an Episcopalian Christian, an, an Apostolic Christian. There's no such thing as a Church of Christ Christian. Because you're playing the same game as everybody else doing when you do it that way. What you need to understand, the church belongs to Christ and whose name should be on it. We're the body of Christ whose name should be on us. What is the prophesied name? Christian. Christ's name has been put up on us. You see, when a per people really understand those things, they understand why we don't call ourselves after these other names because those other names are not in the Bible. Just Christ. He made him be head over all things to the church. There's only one Lord. And if there's only one Lord, whose name should we be getting baptized into? His. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. So a church functions like a body. And what you have to understand, my body works together. My body does not moonlight. You know, my feet don't go help other people out at nighttime while I'm sleeping. <laughs> Let me help you get my point here. <laughs> my feet work with my body. My hands work together with my body. My hands do not decide they want to go do something else with another body somewhere. I'm not getting my analogy here. Do stuff with some other body 
when I'm sleeping or when I'm not busy. We're the body of Christ. We don't moonlight other places. You know, you know, here's the point I'm talking about. See, many people don't actually get this. We can talk this till we're blue in the face. But we have members on the roll of the body of Christ that say, well, you know, I went and visited at my girlfriend's church because she's the pastor over there and everything. Like, <laughs> look, <laughs> the body of Christ, my feet don't moonlight at other bodies. <laughs> I'm trying to get us to understand something very simple here. There's one body. There's one acceptable body in the scriptures. And, and I haven't even explained it to you, but you need to find that one body. And if, if you go to a church that is not willing to stand flat-footed and say, we are that one body, you just need to leave. Because they want to say, like, that's all kind of acceptable bodies. Did Jesus say that? Did the Bible say that? No. no. There's one. It's not, one is the easiest number to understand. And so a, a strong church functions as one body. And a strong church functions, a strong church, acceptable church to God, functions as the body of Christ. This is what we have to understand. And so the church is not an, organ, an organization, it is an organism. An organism that works together, works together as one. We also covered that the church loves like a family. Not loves like, you know, that goosey feeling always, right? Because here's the thing, a church loves like a family, and when you understand how the Bible describes the, the uh, uh, how the Bible describes a family, then you understand why we should work a certain way. You know, God is called our Father, right? So we understand how we relate to Him. Okay, but you also have to understand that inside the church, you actually have uh, uh, the older women and the older men, and as younger people, well, I can't even say that no more. <laughs> As, as, as when I was a younger person, I had to treat them with the same respect that I would have treated my own mother. You couldn't just talk to people, you didn't talk to people disrespectfully, be, you know, that were older than you, that, had, that, were, that were your seniors, right? And so you, you respect them, you respect their age, and you, and you treat them that way, you know? The Bible actually makes, Jesus makes it very, very plain that even if, even if it came down to it, that if because of his, his word and because of the gospel's sake, if your own mother is going to turn against you, inside the church you have a hundred mothers. Hundreds. You have a, hundreds of fathers. You have hundreds of sisters and hundreds of brothers. And we have to start looking at each other that way. And here's what you need to understand. Many times people get confused about what it means to love your brother, to love your sister. You see... I love my brother, and I love my physical brother, and I love my physical sisters, right? I don't tell them that all the time, right? But I do. And even though we would fight and argue among ourselves, it did not change our relationship. At the end of the argument, that's still my sister, that's still my brother. And if, it can, and if I had the worst argument with my sister that day, or the worst argument with my brother that day, even if I was absolutely mad at them, I would not let anybody come and mess with my brother or sister. You see my point? I might beat up on them, but I'm not letting nobody on that does not have their well-being in mind. Nobody doesn't care about them, treat them badly. I'm not, it's not going to happen, right? And so when we get to the point that we can start loving each other that way, to where when you actually have a disagreement, you don't want to just take your toys and go home. You know why you can't take your toys and go home? Because you live in the same house. You follow me? You got the same father. And inside our Father's house, you can't just act any way you want to act. So love does not, we, 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 always, we always confuse this love with this goosey feeling, and it's not the goosey feeling. You know, you have your children, you love your children, right? I know you do, I ain't even got to ask you that question. But who can push your buttons faster than your children? Think about it for a second. The only reason that happens is because you love them. But see, if you don't love somebody very much, who cares what they think about me today? Who cares what they treat me? But think about it. Can people, can who, who do you love more than your children? But who can push your buttons faster? I don't know. But think about it. Well, yourself too, yeah. Mm -hmm. But they, can they get on your, do they know how to get on your nerves? Yeah, see my point? Does it mean you don't love them? No, you still love them. And so what you have to understand is when we can get to the point that in, in the Lord's church that we can be that way, even if you're getting on my nerves, it doesn't change the fact that you're my brother and you're my sister. And no matter what, I'm still going to look after you today, okay? I may not be, feel like doing it, but I'm still going to do it. You see, this is when we get to the, see, when we, a, a, a strong church loves like a family. 
Love's like a family. Family, you know, if you, if you deal with family, you live close to your family, you'll get on each other's nerves. You know, when I go back to Austin, when I go to Austin, I'll throw my sisters on the bus. When I go back to Austin, you know, when my mother was still living, I'd go back to Austin and my mother was always happy to see me. My sister, my brother was always happy to see me because they didn't see me all the time. You know why they were always happy to see me? Because I wasn't there getting on their nerves all the time. Where when I get there, they want to complain about each other. They want to complain about mom, right? I get there, my mom is complaining about my sisters. And I'm just, man, she's singing my praises. Because <laughs> here's the thing, when you hang out with each other long enough, and we get to know each other good enough, you get to realize, <laughs> let me just say it this way. You know, we all actually have, we all put on our best face, right? And we should put on your best face. You should always put on your, do your best to try to encourage your brother and your sister. But you know when you hang out with each other long enough, you realize, some of us can be jerks sometimes. Now, I might be that person you're thinking about when, you, when I said that. But it still should not change the fact that I'm your brother. You see, we need to start looking at each, loving each other like a family loves each other. Not based on how we feel, but based on the value and the family that you're in. And if anybody in the family is being attacked, purposefully or unpurposefully, uh, purposely or uh, knowingly or unknowingly, somebody's attacking them spiritually or attacking them physically. They need to understand that the family is behind them. We're not going to leave people out there to be destroyed. See, that's a strong church. We also need to understand a strong, uh, a, a strong church praises like a temple. You know, we are the body of Christ. A lot of times in, in, we, we, there's a whole lot of things that's happening in the media to where people want to say that we can treat I can treat my body any way I want to treat my body. It's my body, my choice, right? Well, here's the thing. When you're in the family of God, it is no longer your body. You've been bought with a price. Somebody paid a very high price for you, okay? And, and so you do no, you're no longer your own person. And because somebody paid a high price for you, you are now indwelled. Once you become a child of God, you're now indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The temple or the dwelling place of the Spirit is the temple of God, okay? And so, in the old days, temples were built. You can still go to some of the places in like, in, in some places in Africa, you can go to places in Rome, you can go to places in Asia where these temples have been built to all these different gods, okay? And those temples were built for the glory of whatever these gods were, right? And then all the different, the, the, the different uh, rituals and everything that were ordained by these supposed gods were recognized inside those temples, right? And there are certain things you can do inside those temples, and there are certain things you could not do inside those temples. But what you need to understand that today, the church, okay, in the church as a whole, and each Christian individually is the temple of God. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three. So, what it means to defile a temple? It means that you bring something inside of the temple that should not be in that temple. There was a time, you know, when the temple, uh, the temple that was actually in Jerusalem, you know, only the priests could actually go into the temple. They had to be dressed a certain way. And there's only certain things that they could bring inside that temple. They had to bring in fire where God told them to bring fire from and when he told them to bring it in. You couldn't just do it any way you wanted to. But if you tried to dress a different way, bring a different type of worship into the temple in Jerusalem or in the tabernacle in the, in the wilderness, if any person just tried to bring anything different in there, they would have got struck dead. That's what happened to Nadab and Abihu. You couldn't just go inside the temple with anything. But you have to understand later on, before the young King Josiah came along, the temple had been so desecrated that there was all kind of imagery to all these other gods inside there. And Josiah was only eight years old. But one of the, but one of the, 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 the scribes actually found the word of God and Shaphan had it read before him. And he realized that we are in trouble. Let me show you what an eight-year-old did whenever the temple had all this idolatry inside the temple. So what, 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 what um, Josiah did, the first thing he did is he had all the idols taken out of the temple of God. He had them burned 
and he had them stomped to powder. So after they were burned, he just stomped them where they just, just powder, right? Then he took all the priests that served inside that temple, put them to death, burned their bodies, and stomped them to powder. Then he went and dug up all the priests that had served inside those temples with those idols that had already died. He dug their bodies up, burned their bodies, and stomped them to powder and realized we are in trouble if we don't make this right with God. You see, what you need to understand is, is that in that day, when, when, when God's temple was defiled by a priest, the, 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 uh, the punishment was death. But for so long, nobody said anything and did anything to where idolatry was just running a rampant inside the temple. Okay? Because when you bring I idols inside the temple, things inside the temple, and you bring stuff in the temple that should not be in the temple, the temple is now defiled. Right? Now, here's the point. When you actually look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we actually see that verse 16 says, he says, Know ye not, or don't you know, that ye, that Y-E means all of you, okay? Ye are the temple of God. Now, and that, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So the temple, the dwelling place of the Spirit of God, where, it used, where God used to meet man in the, with man in the temple, in the holiest of holies, he would actually make his presence known. You know, in the holiest of holies when the high priest would go in. That's when God would meet with man in the, the temple, or the tabernacle at the time before the temple was built, right? But now the dwelling place where man meets with God is in you. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Which temple you are, you are. Now notice this. If any man, who does that leave out? Now this is man generic. This ain't just mean man. It's man or woman. If any man defile the temple of God, mean defile your temple. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You see, so what you have to understand, a strong church functions like a temple, the temple of God. And if we're going to function like the temple of God, the only things that we bring into the temple, to the, the church gathering or the individual temple, is things that God says should be in there. Because I just want to make sure my Bible didn't know said it. He said, if any man defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. Is that what your Bible said? Do you, think that, do you think there's any scenario that you can actually defile your temple or defile this temple as a church and it turns out good for us? You think we're going to escape that? No. You see, we are the temple of God. And so as a temple of God, we offer spiritual sacrifices, the things that God said. If God didn't say it, we don't offer it. We offer spiritual sacrifices. We also proclaim the praises of God, right? When it all said and done, when after we get to the end of our worship and everything, you know what should, who should have been glorified? It should not be, you know, Brother Howe, that was just an amazing lesson. You know, I'm like, no, you understood God's word, you give God the glory for God's word. That's not my word. When it comes down to it, at the end, like, Mr. Man, I appreciate that song today. Yeah, I appreciate that song, you know. And usually what I say, I, what I say when somebody says it to me, Shemaine says, I, pre I enjoyed singing with you. But the whole goal, you weren't singing for me, and I wasn't singing for you to start off with. I was praising God and encouraging you with my praise, and you encouraging me with your praise. Okay? And so a strong church worships like a temple. See, you're the temple. And this is why I try to get us to understand this. I know a lot of times we, we have this standoffish, but you have to understand is that there's been many times that, that I've gone to lead a song, and the only person I can hear singing is me. If you're the temple of God, then praises need to be coming from your temple. <laughs> you say, Brother Howell, I know the song. I understand. Okay. We can roll with that for a little bit. But after a while, you know, you have to be able to give God your best. A strong church understands that. If it's nine people in the room, nine people that understand this, the singing will be amazing. 200 people that don't get this is mediocre singing. Yeah. And see what you have to understand, when singing the right way, when offering God the praise that he wants, the way he, he says it, he said it's a sweet smelling savor. It smells good to him. It, it, it pleases him. And you have to ask yourself a very simple question. When you're praising God, when you're praying to God, when you're paying attention to his lesson, does your, does your worship, is it a sweet smelling savor or does it stink? 
Would you even accept it if somebody was offering a love song to you saying the way you're singing it? You follow me? I know there's times when we come in and sometimes we're hurting so bad that we can't even get a word to come out of our mouth sometimes. We understand that. Sometimes you have your weekdays. Sometimes well, that's why we're, I'm going to sing my best to make sure you understand that, that our God is still great. He's still looking after you. He still loves you. But I'm trying to encourage you so you can be strong so when my time comes that you can sing for me and encourage me too. A strong church understands this. A strong church worships like a temple and doesn't bring anything in it contrary to who we're trying to worship. If, if the whole goal is to be pleasing to God, wouldn't it make sense that you'd offer him what he asked for? Not what you felt like? If you're doing what you felt like, then that's you. You, you're not worshiping God, you, you're worshiping you. We also recognize that a strong church submits like a kingdom. As the church, we are privileged to be in the kingdom of Christ. Colossians chapter 1 and in verse number 13. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 13, the Bible says, we're talking about well, verse number 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. It's a privilege to be inside the family of God. Let me help you understand something here. Being active inside the body of Christ and in the family of God, it's a wonderful thing because the church can grow, but you need to understand that you are not doing the body favors. You're not doing God any favors. God is the one who placed you there. God is a privilege that God would be willing to take you and I into his family and give us his name. That's a privilege. A name that's a name that's above all names. One of the things I was going to cover tonight, I might cover it next week, is that do you understand that, you know, just to show you just how, we, how we're, we're royalty. You know, when, when, when Paul was giving directions to the, to the church about how that you should not be taking like lawsuits against brethren and then taking lawsuits uh, uh, to, 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 to ungodly people. In other words, he says, don't you know that the saints, talking about us, that the saints shall judge the world? Now, when you understand that, how is that? You understand that when Jesus says the words that I speak are not mine, but the Father who sent me. And the same words that he speaks will judge us in the last day, right? We also recognize Shemaine and Matthew, he says that the, the, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Right? We have the word of God. The word that we're speaking, the word that we're spreading will judge the world. So why would you go to ungodly men that do not have the knowledge of God and the wisdom of God to, de to, de to decide disputes among royalty? <laughs> You see, we need to make sure we understand who we are. Inside the kingdom, we have a king, and we are privileged to be put in the family of God inside the kingdom. And this is what Paul was saying. You know, we need to praise God because he's taken us. He's, he's translated. He's taken us. He's changed our position. He's changed our person. He's changed our being. He changed our status in society. That's why he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And that's what John the Revelator says, that we are kings and priests. We're royalty. Not because of how great we are, but because we're in the royal family, we are royalty. We're kings and we're priests. Now, a kingdom suggests that there's a king and that we're subject to the king, right? If you're in a kingdom, you're subject to a king. Even the princess and even the, 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 even the, uh, the dukes and the duchesses, they're all a royalty. But they all, they cannot even have that position unless there's a king. If you understand the way kings work in Europe, okay, or other places around the world. The problem is, is that many times we don't function as a kingdom. Many churches act more like the, king, the, king, the, the kingdom of England than the kingdom that's described in the scriptures. What do you mean? Where the king is just mainly a symbolic figure of head. When really a lot of stuff is decided by the parliament and other people. It's not like that, okay? A strong church is one where the citizens or the members submit to Christ as king in reality. You see, we bow our knee to him. We recognize that we are not his equals. We recognize that he is 
a potentate. You know what a potentate is? Absolute power. Absolute. He doesn't have to delegate any power. If anybody has any power, God gave them to them. But ultimately, he's the ultimate power. He reigns supreme. That's what a potentate is. Okay? Usually we only hear that when you hear guys that called, want to compare that to a dictator. The problem with dictators, dictators, they can make a whole bunch of rules, but eventually they get overthrown when people get tired of them, right? This ain't going to happen with Jesus. You see, we have a king. And since we have a king, we don't get a chance to vote on what we want to do as what's right and what's wrong. Many people are thinking you can do that, and that's why they want to say they can live any way they want to live, act the way they want to live, and still claim to be Christian. No, we have a king. The king decides everything. And so, so a strong church is one where the citizens submit to Christ in reality as king, where things are done as he directs, by his authority and by his power, where we, where we follow his commands and not make up our own rules. See, a strong church submits to Christ and recognize and, uh, and functions as a king. We also recognize, and I'll end here tonight, that a strong church is one that is pure as a bride. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Would to God ye bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealous. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, what he's trying to say here is that, you know, I want to make sure you understand I put a whole lot of work into this, arranging this marriage. Okay? And I want to present you to Christ as a chaste virgin. What does a chaste virgin mean? What does chaste mean? Not chaste to where you, you know, you're trying to get everybody to follow you around. Like, you know, not winning fast girls. That's being chaste. Not that. What does chaste mean? Huh? Pure. pure, meaning like you have to understand that, that, that she has kept herself, she's kept herself pure. Chaste is like where we get the word chastity from, okay? Chaste, she's pure. Her, her purity is unquestionable, okay? Now, you know, I just forgot something. Pam, what were you going to tell me earlier, Pam? Forget it. Uh, okay. <laughs> did, did you forget? No. Okay, then go ahead. So I can actually, okay, I'm sorry. So a, chaste, so a chaste virgin, he said, I can present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He says, espouse, that means your bride. Later on, we see in the Revelation that, 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 that the church is the bride also. And so what you have to understand is that one that, number one, he said that he thought the church to be a, as a bride because he betrothed one bride to Christ. Christ only has one bride. You know why he only has one bride? Because he only has one church. If there's more than one church, that would make him a polygamist. No, there's one church because there's only one bride, right? And also, the church is one that has the responsibility to be pure and chaste, okay? Now, here's the point I'm trying to actually make here, you know? You know, when you, when, ladies, when you're trying to catch a man, you're trying to catch a man based on your marriage. You want to make sure he knows that he can trust you, that you're with him, and that you're going to be with nobody but him, right? Now, I know a lot of people don't understand that today, but that's really what people want. Nobody really wants, you know, a wife or a husband that wants to be with them and somebody else at the same time. Nobody wants that, right? Chase means that you have that under control, okay? And so what you have to understand is, is that the responsibility of the bride or the church in this particular case to the groom, which is Christ himself, the responsibility of the bride is to maintain purity. Because no man wants an unpure, uncontrolled bride. Now, just to be fair, no bride wants no unpure, uncontrolled husband. But we're using this analogy right now. So Christ thinks of the church in the same way. You see, in Ephesians chapter 5, he used a very simple example to try to explain marriage in the, in the form of his relationship to his church. And in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse number 25 and following, he actually says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church 
and gave himself for it, that he may sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present it to himself a glorious or a beautiful church, not having spot or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And so he used this analogy about how husbands ought to love their wives, explaining how Christ loved the church. Christ did everything necessary to make sure that his bride was beautiful, to make sure that his bride was pure, to make sure that his bride was chaste, to make sure that his bride was reputation was upheld. And so you understand that if he did everything necessary in his power to do it, then he's expecting his bride to be pure. He's expecting his bride to be chaste. He didn't just say it, he sacrificed himself to make sure that she knew how much he, he loves her so that she's motivated by his love and his care to be chaste, okay? So as a bride waiting, so what we have to understand is that uh, he offered himself to enable her to be pure and holy, but he also did it out of his great love for her. John was told of the future marriage in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 9. And the Bible actually says that the bride made herself ready for the wedding. The bride has that responsibility to make herself ready. We have the responsibility to make ourselves ready. She was adorned with righteous acts, being righteous. That's the way she adorned herself. That's the way she presented herself to her bride, being righteous. And as a bride awaiting marriage, we must maintain our purity and our adornment by cleansing, cleansing through the blood of Christ. The Bible said he washed her with pure water. In other words, what are we supposed to be doing? If you want to actually present yourself to Christ as a chaste bride, as clean, right, as pure, you have to first be baptized, Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. You must then be willing to confess. You, know, you, must, you must be also willing to confess your sins and confess that you're wrong when you're wrong. As his bride, if you're wrong, you're wrong. You confess your sins and he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and the blood of Jesus Christ will continually cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So it makes it possible for us to maintain our purity. We also maintain our purity by doing the right thing, not just thinking, but doing the right thing and abstaining from unrighteous things. Ephesians chapter five, verses three through five. You see, here's how you measure a strong church. A strong church functions like a body. A strong church loves like a family. A strong church praises like a temple. And a strong church submits like a kingdom. And a strong church is as a pure bride. You see, whether it be five, or whether it be 500, a strong church will have these attributes and strive to have these attributes. How each person does his or her part will affect, will have an effect on the measure of the church. You see, truly, the strength of the church is not only measured by how many strong Christians you have, the strength of the church is also measured by how many weak ones you have. Because we can only be as strong as the weak ones. But if everybody's doing their part, loving each other, submitting to the king, praising the way God, you know, when we gather ourselves together on Sunday, it ain't be something with something, it ain't gonna be something we do. It ain't gonna be something that's like a chore where you wake up on Sunday morning like, Oh, man, it's Sunday. I got to get up and go to church. Huh, am I going to do this? It ain't even like that no more. That's, what, that's the way you're going to treat work. But church is going to be like, oh, it's the day. It's time. Because that's when we gain our strength. That's when we look forward to getting, to being a hangout with the people, being with the body, being with the family. When you're hurting, you know, when you're that, when you're that little toe that's hurting, that all those hands and those arms and all those other parts of the body come and hug you. You see, that's what this is all about. So next week, we're going to talk about what makes, how do you define a, what makes a strong Christian? What makes a strong individual? And we're going to see what the Bible has to say about that. Any questions, any comments? All righty. Any announcements we need to know about?